Yamadumurang, Nadu Yinjamara Burundi, Mayan Kulan Mayan. Yinjamara Wurundjeri Nurembung. In my language, I want to pay respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we are meeting here tonight and send my love and respects to the members of the Stolen Generations on this anniversary of the apology. Tonight, who do you trust in a world that feels increasingly out of our control? Whether it's the Reserve Bank upping interest rates, Chinese spy balloons or artificial intelligence that may make us redundant. Joining our panel, British journalist and host of the News Agents podcast, John Sopor. Green Senator for WA, Dorinda Cox, who is today appointed as the party's First Nation spokesperson. Liberal member for Menzies and Afghanistan veteran Keith Lowerhan. Minister for Youth and Early Childhood Education, Anne Ali. And Professor of Artificial Intelligence at UNSW, Toby Watt. Can we take back control? Tonight, thank you for that lovely welcome. I'm Stan Grant. It's great to be with you. Now, remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. And later, we'll be discussing artificial intelligence, which is the subject of our online poll tonight. This is what we're asking. Are you concerned about the increasing presence of artificial intelligence in our everyday lives? Now, you can cast your votes on our Facebook and Twitter accounts, and we'll bring you those results a bit later. Let's get started with our first question tonight from Alison Troth. Inflation and cost of living is not just the elephant in the room, it is an entire heard. Conversations with my friends are focusing on negotiating extra casual shifts or how we can join the gig economy just to pay the kids' school expenses or their sports fees, let alone the mortgage. So where's the hope? And Ali. Thanks, Stan. Alison, is it? Thank you so much for your question, Alison. Look, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, and the Treasurer certain has a, has, certainly hasn't sugarcoated it either. Inflation is rising and interest rates are rising and cost of living pressures on families and individuals right across Australia is really being felt. Um, I've got to say, though, that I've spent pretty much my entire parliamentary career standing up in Parliament talking about cost of living pressures for some sections of the people that I represent in Cowan, particularly in those lower socioeconomic suburbs. So I think that those people have been feeling the cost of living pressures much more acutely now and for longer. Uh, but there is hope, as the Treasurer has said. He believes, and he's said this, that inflation has hit its highest point. Um, and, you know, we're doing things, we're doing where we can, we're offering cost of living relief, whether it be in my area of more affordable early childhood education and care, or in other areas of, of, of relief. We're doing things to repair the economy. We're introducing uh, the uh, manufacturing fund to reinvigorate manufacturing in Australia, diversify our economy, create more jobs in manufacturing. And we're repairing the budget as well. So, you know, I know it's tough. I know it's tough. The other day I was at the shops and, and I think, you know, just observing um, a gentleman there who was buying bread and mm. was counting his coins to buy the bread and how much, how expensive the bread was. Like, I remember those days from when I was a single mum, but to see people in some of my wealthier suburbs doing that, mm. um, it really does hit and, home. And here's the thing, Anne, you can't mm. look at Alison and tell her that interest rates are not going to continue to go up because the Reserve Bank sets them and you don't have control over that. We don't have that. control over what the Reserve Bank sets. It's an independent body. Um, and, and, and they said, it. you know, I will say that the banks are being hauled in and, and questioned about their rates rises. Um, but, you know, uh, there's no sugarcoating it, Alison. There's none. Keith Wallahan, um, you may be looking here and thinking, gee, we're not in government. Um, we dodged a bullet here because inflation was moving and interest rates were moving as your government, the previous government, was coming to an end as well. So this was coming regardless of who was going to be in power, wasn't it? 
Well, it, you've got to look at it about how it affects families. So in my seat in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, families are doing it really tough. And soon we'll have a by-election in the seat of Aston. And so if you look at an average mortgage in Aston, in Bayswater, in Roeville, a $750,000 mortgage, a family will be paying $18,000 more this year. Now, that's after tax. So you need to have an increase in your wages of about $24,000. Now, there's that's a trade off. That's, that's massive. So, families, if you're a teacher on $85,000 or a store manager on $72,000, that money's not sitting there and your boss is not going to just give it to you. So, you're going to have to cut other discretionary spending, whether it's school excursions, food, heating. So, this affects real people's lives. So, Stan, there is a political element, but, but I'm actually genuinely worried. In my seat, there's six food banks. And those queues are out the door. And often, I just spoke about families where two people are earning an income, but when there's a divorce or someone dies and you've got that mortgage to pay, I see mums with kids in the car begging for food. So mm. this is something we should all lean in and help and f try and fix it. And Dorinda, when it comes to this, I mean, the Greens are in the same situation. This, to, to a large extent, how captive is Australia to pressures beyond our control, whether it be a war in Ukraine, rising inflation elsewhere, increasing interest rates in the United States, which ultimately flows through mm. and exports inflation to other parts of the world as well. This is something that was going to hit us. How do you protect the most vulnerable? Well, I think you... You, I, I'm, you know, the excuses have been thick and fast, both from the current government and previous. And I think the thing that we can look to is state street tax cuts. Like, that is something the government can do. And, uh, you know, we know the global pressures, but everyday Australians are feeling the, the cost of living pressures. There are rent freezes, there are putting dental and mental health into Medicare, there's raising the income support above the poverty line. There are very real things that the government can concurrently do to ease those uh, cost of living pressures. I, I might just go back to Anne very quickly mm. on that, because this has been, the, the stage three tax cuts has been an ongoing issue, and there's been calls for the government to walk away from this, because ultimately it'll put a lot more money into the hands of wealthier people. Are you prepared to do that and look at redirecting that to support lower income people? Well, I think the stage three tax cuts aren't due to come in for a couple of years anyway. So, you know, looking at real relief now, I think, is, is, is an issue. And that's some of the things that we're putting in place now, real relief right now when it really, really matters. But we also have to ensure that the things that we do don't add more pressure on inflation. And Jim Chalmers has spoken about this very lucidly, about you know, ensuring that the relief that we, th that we do and the measures that we take don't actually add more inflationary pressure. Yes, wages need to rise. And you know, let's face it, we've had 10 years of stagnant wages. And we've done, we've put in IR measures. Uh, Tony Burke has introduced last year measures in to reform the IR system to ensure that some of our lowest paid workers can get pay rises. Um, but, you know, all of those things individually mm. aren't going to help. But collectively, they can afford families, they can afford individuals some, some relief. And we are talking about families who are caught in the crosshairs. And, Alison, mm. you raised this. That's, I want to bring in Amy Yetfoy, who is going to join us from Padstow in New South Wales. Amy, thank you for, for joining us on the program. Uh, I want to ask you about your situation and what the increase in interest rates has meant for you in terms of what you are paying now, the money you have to find that you didn't have to find before. Yeah, thanks, Stan. Hi, pal. Um, it's absolutely right. So, you know, when we first financed our home because of the very small amount that we had, you know, initially to put down for it, we had to split our loan into half fixed or well, a lot more fixed and a lot less variable. And so, you know, with all of this increasing, we've recently refinanced um, the last 12 months to 18 months or so, which has meant an additional 20% in our mortgage repayments mm. monthly for us. Um, and then our fixed rate, which is due to expire at the end of this year towards beginning of next year, which is our largest chunk, um, at current interest rates, we're looking at additionally $500 a week on our initial loan. Which Five, we, $500 you know, a week. And so huge. where does that yeah. come from? What, what do you rate. cut back on? <laughs> Everything, Stan. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that we're trying to do things, but when you have two children, $150 doesn't go very far. Mm. When it costs you $800 for... This is in a public school for school uniforms just to get us set up for summer. So, you know, I see little things happening, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I can't earn any more. My capacity is what it's at. So is my partner. He works shift work. My children are too young to work, so... 
What do we do? <laughs> and, and one of the things, Amy, um, to do, I suppose, is you have to look at the reality and people are going to face this, <coughs> potentially having to sell your homes. Are you at that point yet? Uh, we are considering it, Stan. You know, mm. when our interest, when our fixed rate comes up in the next 12 months, when we can't afford an additional $500 a week, we actually really don't know what we're going to do. Um, you know, living in South West Sydney, we can't even rent a place. And, but, you know, I talked to my husband about it a lot over the last 12 months, and he says we couldn't even sell this house to buy another one. So it's not... We're in a very, mm. you know, tough position right now. So what's the question you would like to put to, put to our panel? Look, so I guess it's twofold. I mean, who is responsible for making these decisions that put so much strain on family life? And if you're saying the Reserve Bank's independent, they have so much power to control my life is incredible. And why is interest rates the focus of slowing the economy? Surely there's other things that we can do. I want to go to the politicians a moment, but I'll bring John in now, because, John, you've observed this in other parts of the world as well. This is a phenomenon that's been sweeping through the world and real people getting hurt. Yeah, and I don't think it's going to be much comfort to any of you if I say that inflation is 7.8%. I think in Australia mm. it's 9.2% in the UK. Interest rates are 3.5% here. They're 4% in the UK. And it's going to be really uncomfortable for huge numbers of people. I don't think that people kind of, you know, the basic concept of inflation everyone gets. If it costs more to fill your car and more to fill the grocery trolley and you've got the same amount of money or declining money, then you're worse off mm. and everyone is feeling worse off. The thing about interest rates is that, I mean, what happened in the UK and happened here, I, I suspect, is that banks were given the task of taking politics out of interest rate decisions so that they can only do one thing, which is raise or cut interest rates. In Britain, we had an experiment with cutting taxes when mm -hmm. Liz Truss was the Prime Minister. It didn't go for, very for, for well. For five minutes. Uh, yeah. she, <laughs> um, she took the economy over the edge of a cliff and she was gone within seven weeks, became mm. the shortest uh, you know, time of a Prime Minister in British history. Mm. So I think that there are no easy answers. And it's true in America and it's true in Britain, it's true in Europe, and there are real pressures. The only thing I would say that, you know, looking at the latest stats coming out of the US is that they feel they've turned the corner, that inflation has peaked, that there will not be the same need for aggressive interest rate rises. And I guess that's a mm. small crumb of comfort. But if you're struggling yeah. to pay the mortgage and pay the food bills... Yeah, or sell your house, up. or sell your house. Yeah. And the question is, mm. um, why interest rates? Is that the only means of being able to slow inflation? Because it's a blunt instrument, we know, and it hurts the most vulnerable. Well, as I said, the Reserve Bank makes its decisions independently. Um, and, um, you know, I know that you know, there is some controversies around the Reserve Bank governor, but his term comes up in, in September. And um, Are you saying that you the, want him gone the, in September? Uh, no, no, I'm not saying that at all. I actually, you know, um, that's something that's not even in my portfolio. So that's something for the Treasurer and um, the government more broadly to decide. Um, look, I, I think there are there are so many global headwinds at the moment, and we live in some, you know, really really uncertain economic times. And I know that you know, like John said, nothing that that I say is going to ease that pressure off people uh, who are experiencing this. I think five hundred dollars increase a week. Um, I just think that's 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 crazy. That's just phenomenal. And I'm, I really feel for you, having been in that situation myself, where I've had to scrimp and save to put food on the table. I really feel it acutely, that pain that people are feeling, both in my electorate and across Australia. What I can say is, as, as John has said, you know, despite all of these global headwinds, the Treasurer has said that he believes that inflation has peaked and that, you know, we can, we can look forward to the future. I think there is, there is, a, there is a glimmer of optimism there um, and that, you know, things will get better once more of our cost of living relief measures come into play. Like, um, I don't know if you use early childhood education at all for your two children, but there will be some relief mm. there for the fees for early childhood education. Um, and, you know, I know it's, it, it feels like empty words coming from a politician, but take it from somebody who is a single mum and who's been through that as well and who's lived in poverty. 
um, that I know that nothing we say is going to make it better for you. Hands up who'd like to see the Reserve Bank Governor here answer, answering some <laughs> questions about... <laughs> yes, you we, have, we have asked Philip Lowe to come on the program twice. Um, we're yet to get... We'll, we'll keep asking. Stan, can, so, can, so, I, can I bring it back in a moment? Yes. Do you want to go to Toby? Because, Toby, there are other options, aren't there, in terms of, of interest rates and mortgages and locking people in for longer at lower rates? It is. In Australia, we're actually we're much more exposed than in other countries like the United States. And in the United States, if you take a mortgage out, you take out a 30-year term fixed rate mortgage. You know exactly what you're going to be uh, up for when you take that mortgage out. There is no um, shock. Um, only a third of our mortgages are fixed rate, and half of those fixed rate, of those fixed rate mortgages this year will end and people will face the sort of bill shock that you talk about. Over $1,000 uh, a month, some, some people even $2,000 a month. That is a big risk. If we, if we want to encourage people to, to become homeowners, then removing that uncertainty, mm. giving us the certainty of fixing our mortgages. I, I, I refixed my mortgage last year. The longest possible you could get is five years. You can't get mm. a long, more, long fixed mortgage. That adds to our problems. It makes us much more exposed. And what I worry about is if we have many more interest rates rises, um, we're going to go into recession. An mm. unnecessary recession. Uh, I want really to get, get a quick comment from you, Keith. No, qu quickly, so, so the Reserve Bank Governor will be putting questions, we'll put questions to him. He'll be at the Senate on Wednesday and I'm on the House Economics Committee and we'll be asking him questions on Friday. But I think two... they'd like to ask the questions, <laughs> wouldn't you? Of course, and, and we'll be asking <laughs> on your Get your, your questions behalf. in now. <laughs> Please do. Uh, but there's two levers here. Monetary policy <laughs> is one lever and it is blunt and it hurts people but it's a necessary one. The other one is fiscal policy, which, which is, is the spending. role for government, and it's about reducing spending. Labor and Liberal need to reduce spending in government, and it brings inflation down and it helps people. You can't have one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake, and currently that's what we're doing. The IMF has warned against that. We have $45 billion from this government in off-market spending. That's inflationary, and it's not good enough, and it's going to hurt people. Amy, I want to thank you. Thank you for your question, Amy. Um, good luck to you. Good luck to your family. Um, I hope things go, go well for you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Daniel. Thanks, Amy. There's a lot to get through tonight. Uh, let's bring in Dennis Fitzgerald now with his question. Dennis? Uh, was the uh, Chinese air balloon full of hot air, was it a, or was it a serious attempt to find out what they could get away with before the Americans took action? Might go to you, Toby, on that. <laughs> Well, I didn't think I was ever going to be talking about UFOs on national TV, but, <laughs> but here I am. Uh, the best uh, explanation I've heard for this, actually, is that um, the US were looking for faster moving objects. They were looking for jets and, and um, satellites. And so it was only when they started, when they, the Chinese sent over a, a spy balloon that was so big. This, the first one was as big as a bus that was actually first seen by people on a commercial aeroplane, that they actually turned the dial down and started looking at slower moving objects, mm. which is why now we've had, at the last count, four of them uh, seen in the last few days. Um, I don't think it's technically very interesting in the sense that um, they're getting information that they haven't been able to get by other means. But I think it says something very profound about the, our relationship with China and how that's changing. John. Um, I mean, there's a lot of speculation in the States at the moment that this is extraterrestrials, <laughs> aliens. I'm going to say that if they manage to get through solar storms, meteor storms, <laughs> into the Earth's atmosphere, have travelled across galaxies, I don't reckon an F-16 plane is going to take it down. <laughs> so I kind of think there's got to be a more logical explanation for what on Earth has happened. But, you know, you're hearing about these objects, and they're not calling them balloons. I mean, I think the head of the kind of air defence systems in America said, I'm not calling them balloons for a reason. They have no propulsion system. It does sound decidedly odd. It sounds like the, the start of Independence Day, and we're waiting <laughs> for Will Smith to come in and take them out. But, I mean, uh, there has got to be some explanation. But I think the point about China that you raise is a serious one mm. because I think that I think China is testing yeah. and looking at weaknesses and looking at vulnerabilities and thinking that maybe we can do this. And it seems odd when there are satellites circling the globe and there are all sorts of ways of gathering intelligence that you need to do this. But I think that the politicians in the West are right to take it seriously. Mm. 
I think, uh, you know, in Australia we have a very prominent and very important independent position that we should play, particularly in relation to the US and China. And we should be looking uh, within our diplomatic uh, relations to really looking at keeping peace in our region. And I think it's an important conversation that we need to be having as a nation. Yeah. It does, it does lead us to our next question as well, which is talking about this question of security in our region from Brenda McMinn. Sorry. Well, I'm 83 years old, a former British subject, and I've lived through all the wars since 1939. I was born at the beginning of 1939. Since wars are becoming more and more destructive and never seem to achieve a better world, do we need a pact tying us to the US and the UK, AUKUS? Will Australia be obliged to follow either of these two countries into yet even more conflict? Anne. Thank you, Brenda. It's lovely to... Um see you here. Thank you for the question. I think there is um, an important role for collective security. And historically, if you look at attempts at collective security, many of them have failed because of differences in values and an assumption of university values, universal kind of values around security. I think uh, uh, for Australia, it's important that we do have alliances um, with uh, the US and with the UK that would help us in security and in defence matters. It's an important alliance for Australia and one that we need to pursue. But that doesn't preclude us from also pursuing, as Dorinda um, suggested, security and peace in our region. And Penny Wong has been incredibly active as the Foreign Minister, going out there and, and um, in the Pacific, uh, with Indonesia, uh, even um, you know, re resetting our ties with China even, or the, or the ways in which we relate with China, uh, there is a huge part for us to play in our region. Uh, but there is also an importance for us to maintain a security alliance with like-minded countries. So, sorry, Anne, but that, mm. that's trying to walk both sides of the street. And at certain Why? points... Well, How certain that... Well, OK, here's an example. Mm. We hear this a lot. Mm. If there was a conflict over Taiwan tomorrow. Mm. You wouldn't be walking two sides of the street and there are choices to be made. So while you're building closer relationships with China right now, inevitably, choices are made about where Australia's interests are served. Are they more served by closer ties to the UK and the US than they are in, in ties with China? Well, I don't think it's about building more, clo more closer ties with China. I think that's, that's kind of misconstruing the relationship here. I think we do have a very strong trade relationship with China. I mean, let's face it, we rely on China for a lot of the products that we use every day. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I do think that we need to build our sovereign capability more and we're certainly working on that and Ed Husik has done some amazing work in that space and, and we need to be more independent. But we do have... China is an important trading partner for Australia. That doesn't mean that we can't call out China on human rights abuses. That doesn't mean that, you know, we can't have the kind of relationship or diplomatic ties with China that allow us to still maintain our sovereignty and our security and the security of our region, Stan. You know, like... You can have a, 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 a friend, but be able to be very frank with that friend and, you know, um, have that friendship on your terms. Keith, that's not often how China responds, though. And, of course, we've seen China take trade sanctions against Australia when it doesn't like decisions that are made. Now we see Australia um, taking out Chinese-supplied cameras from defence installations because of concerns We should be building spying. our own cameras. So how do we manage this moment, Keith? I think to, to the question, Brenda, I've served in war. I, I was in Afghanistan three times. I would never wish that on anyone else or my children. So I'm not in the business of starting wars. We're in the business of preventing wars. And weakness is provocative. So you, it, it, it's in our interest to form alliances, especially with like-minded democracies, because democracies are being threatened by autocracies around the world. And I ask you to look at two examples. The end of the Afghanistan war, which was tragic, that sent a signal that contributed to the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. It sent a signal of weakness. But then you look at the people of Ukraine and what they're doing standing up to the Russian invasion.
that is sending a signal to the region, one that I think will bring us peace in this region. So it's important that we show strength and that we stand with allies who are democracies. Yeah. Brenda, it's such a good question because obviously people feel that, you know, if only we could just do things easily. If you look at Northern Europe, where the Second World War was largely fought, where my father served as a service, you know, was in the war, um, NATO, which was formed in 1948, mm. has sort of kept the peace. Not perfectly, but sort of kept the peace ever since then. And so alliances are not just a way of kind of protecting yourself, they enhance your own sovereignty because they reduce the risk that any one country will attack you. And I know that that is what the architects of AUKUS, and I was the BBC's North America editor when it got signed and the French suddenly pulled their ambassador out of Washington, which seemed an extraordinary thing to do. But it does seem interesting what has happened. And Australia plays a vital role in the Five Eyes Agreement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was endlessly asked to talk about the special relationship. This is the intelligence both, sharing agreement. Yeah, this, the intelligence sharing agreement between Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Canada, mm -hmm. and the US. And the US really value that, and that is really important towards national security as well. So cooperation, I think, if you look over history, has helped us and helped stop wars not start them. I'm, I'm not sure Brenda's entirely convinced, are you, Brenda? <laughs> no, I can say not convinced. I, well, over the past 50 years or so, we've been drawn into wars by the US. Mm. The US <laughs> took us into, into, you know, Vietnam and, and, and into all these other places. Um, is this going to happen again? This is what I'm saying. If we have a pact with them and they dis and the US decides, not us, the US decides that they that they're going to go into a war, do we follow like we've done before? I'll, I'll, I'll go to Dorinda. Mm. Yeah, great. <laughs> Brenda, and you've articulated that so beautifully. And what I was going to say is that what is extremely obvious, and, and Anne actually mentioned it, was about our sovereign capability. We do not have the infrastructure here in Australia to support nuclear submarines. That is obvious. We are getting into an arrangement and into a relationship, an ongoing relationship with the US because we don't have that sovereign capability. We are actually creating a rod for our own back. So you're exactly right in what you're saying. And we absolutely, I mean, the Greens have always had a policy about no nuclear and no nuclear subs, and we will continue to stand by that. So I think we have to... Thank you, Brenda. I know Toby... Toby's got a bit to say about AI and weapons, and we're going to come to that a little bit later. But if you're joining us, just joining us now, you're watching Q&A. And, of course, we're live with John Sopel, Dorinda Cox, Keith Wallahan and Ali and Toby Walsh. Let's get to another topic now. Here's James Mason. Oh, hi, all. Hi, panel. Um, I'm just wondering if chat GPT... I'm wondering if that can help me pick the Melbourne Cup winner. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, how much should I bet on it? There, there might be people like me scratching their heads and going, chat GPT? <laughs> Toby, what is it? Well, it could have been better named. It's the latest <laughs> super duper chatbot. Um, it's a, an interface that you can have a conversation with. You can ask it questions. You can ask it to write an MP's speech or compose you a poem in the style of Shakespeare, whatever you would like. You could ask it, um, as you suggest, who's going to win the Melbourne Cup? I've got bad news for you. It was only trained on data after 2021, so it has no idea who's going so to win. So it'll tell you who won last, uh, last two years, but <laughs> yeah. not this year. It won't even tell you who, who won last year's uh, Melbourne Cup. So it's, it's not omnipotent. Um, but... It, it, it's certainly an eye-opening moment. It's one of those moments. I saw the first demo of it, and I was reminded of when I saw the very first browser in 93, and I thought, OK, that's how... Uh, I've been using the internet for many years, but that's how all of us are going to be able to access the internet. I remember when I saw the first iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs demoed the first iPhone in 2007, and I thought, that's amazing. That's how we're all going to have these computers in our hands. Um, and when I saw the first demo of this, I thought, OK, that's a future, that's our future when we're going to have conversations with computers. We're going to talk to them, and they're going to be somewhat intelligent. It's still um, got a lot of limitations and bugs, and uh, we've still got a long way to go, but it was one of those moments where you saw a vision of the future. 
Mm. Is that the future we want? Okay, and I... I'm going to tell you something because <laughs> no, I've says. got a confession to make <laughs> and that confession is that I did not get my husband anything for Valentine's Day. So I asked <laughs> ChatGPT to come up with a message <laughs> and this was the message that it came up with. On national TV. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, Dave. You are loved and appreciated today and every day. Wish you all the happiness and love in the world. Straight from the heart. <laughs> 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 I would never say that. There is no way on earth I would ever say anything like that. So it, it's not sentient. No. It doesn't capture Are you going to give Dave emotion. his message? No, <laughs> no, no, no my message good. for Dave is <laughs> roses are red, violets are blue. I'm not very romantic. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to get you a card today, so I'm giving you a shout-out on Q&A. Oh. <laughs> We need the backing track, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but seriously, Keith, there are concerns here. It's been banned in some places. Mm. Um, should we be looking at banning it? Well, I'm not, in, as a Liberal, not into banning things, unless there's good reason. Um, <laughs> that, we, we won't go there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can just imagine well, the conversations yes, people are yeah. having in their heads right now. For, for good reason. But um, history was made in the Parliament this week. Uh, a good friend of mine and, and neighbour, Aaron Violi, uh, delivered the first AI-generated speech in the Parliament. And today I, I took him out of question time and said, oh, uh, is there anything you'd like to say? And he said, oh, it really scared me, uh, because it seemed so real. Mm. And that comes back to the question you had, Brenda. That, that does worry me about the future of warfare, and I'm, that might be another question. It is. Stan, but, um, mm. uh, you know, there's... We can't really... Aaron said we can't really trust what we see and hear anymore. And so when you see chat GPT and then you look at those videos of Boston Dynamics, I'm worried about those two things meeting each other and, and what that means for our future. Um, when you look at nuclear weapons in 1945, it took 20 years for us to have a regime of control, and we're still mm. working on that. Mm. So th the regulatory lead time is really long, but this is moving so quickly. Yeah. I, I was with mm. um, a very senior executive from Meta, which owns Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram, and they are spending next year 34 billion US dollars just on research, largely on AI. And when the whole question of ChatGBT came up, this guy said to me, this is the foothills mm. of what you're looking at. Yeah. Mm. What, what, what AI is going to be able to do in the future is frankly terrifying. I do think there's an irony, though, that you know, AI has been encroaching on factory floor jobs, has been encroaching on call centres jobs. Now that it could do politicians out of work <laughs> and journalists <laughs> out of work, oh, we're suddenly, yes. well, we're oh. suddenly quite concerned about it. <laughs> yes. Tell, tell <laughs> Let's stay with AI. A uh, question now from Joan Barlow. Oh, a question for you, Toby Walsh. I very recently read an article um, in which it described a situation in which AI was unexpectedly found to be very proficient in designing a lethal new nerve agent. Mm. Um, is it possible for designers using AI to ever anticipate such potentially lethal outcomes, and if they do, and what to do if such outcomes are discovered? Th thank you. That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, um, unfortunately, um, if you can get... Uh, um, the original program was designed to come up with um, nice chemicals, useful chemicals, mm -hmm. and then they just turned it around and said, well, OK, let's, let's ask the opposite question. Uh, can you design something that's, that's quite dangerous? And it was actually very effective at, at designing some recognised nerve agents. And that, that is the consequence of... AI is entirely dual use. There are positive uses, mm -hmm. and often the very same algorithms can be put to, to very negative uses. Mm -hmm. um, and it's how like we choose... Like human beings. Like human beings, yeah. yes. Um, but... An added complication is the unexpected consequences that we often cannot predict, we can't see. In that case, um, we've seen a few things like that in the past. It was possible, I mean, they asked the very the question. In fact, the fact they asked the question, they knew that it was possible. But the unexpected consequences, and we see this at scale with companies like Meta, because we've never had a technology before where you can touch a billion people overnight. 
um, and even small effects, even small effects uh, on our social media that can polarize us, that can change, change our political debate, can have really profound impacts and can learn, end up with changing the outcome of an election, as we possibly saw um, in the US, or change the outcome of a referendum, as we saw with Brexit. There are, there are very profound consequences of this technology, and we have to what, think very carefully what, through What do we do, Dorinda? Um, I think what, you know, this is ever evolving and, and, and evolving very, very rapidly and I agree with Keith's comment around the regulatory framework that this needs to sit within. What I also think is really important to acknowledge is that is the data that you input into that, mm. it's only as good as that, right? Like, it, it can only be as good as the human data that's being put into it. Mm. But also, it... We all have that experience of being unsafe on the internet. And I think reinforcing some of those structural disadvantages, such as uh, facial recognition, mm. that's, that's already been proven. It's, it's well held as a view. And we have to understand that, that disadvantaged groups, whether it's gender, race and others, are going to be heightened in this in, um, evolution of AI in the future. The, I, I, I want to come back to... Um, I want to come back to you, Joan, in, in, in just a moment, because you're a, you work in education, so I want to come back to you on how this affects education. But, Keith, as someone who served um, in war, and Toby's touched on the, the, the consequences of this, we see this with drone warfare now as well, where people can be killed without ever having to look into their eyes. Robot armies, um, which don't make human calculations, human decisions, that are indefatigable, um, they'll just march and, and fight um, to beyond exhaustion, because they don't get exhausted. What does it mean for the battlefield and what does it mean for warfare? It's a very good question. So there was a study done on the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, uh, I think around 2014, and 90% of the civilian casualties were in error, human error. And so humans, we made mistakes. And you're right, the further you are from the battlefield in an aircraft or operating a drone, the more likely you'll make a mistake. And, and, and I saw it. I saw times when there was a drone that looked like someone was carrying an explosive and then on further investigation they were carrying a baby. Mm -hmm. and, and you need a human there to make those sort of calculations because I don't trust an algorithm to show compassion and humanity even when all the boxes are ticked to engage. We need more of that. Joan, for education, and we talked about... We talked about ChatGPT, and that can do your homework, apparently, as well. If only, if only it was around. Um, what, what are the consequences for education, as you see it, from AI? Well, I, I'm not so worried about cheating um, in education, to be honest. Um, I'm more concerned about the deeper if issue. I played around with Chat. Mm. GBT yesterday, asking wonderful questions. Um, and I'm teaching Nietzsche on Friday, people who might know. Ne uh, Nietzsche and yeah. GBT opens up all sorts of possibilities. Well, but, it was but he did say he did say God was dead, and maybe that's what artificial yeah. intelligence means. But it blew my mind because because I asked the question, what would Nietzsche think of AI? Mm. And this wonderful answer came back, and that made me really reflect on Really, what does it mean? Now, this is getting a bit philosophic, I know, but really our humanness. Mm. And if mm. we've got these large language mod models and they can produce this wonderful stuff, not like your poor Dave, <laughs> your poor him, um, really, what does it mean? What happens to our creativity mm. or what could happen might... to human creativity, our individuality... Um, our real sense of being human, really, if there's this huge model that can produce this amazing stuff. It blew my mind, yeah, yeah. really. Oh, I, I might throw that one to John. N Nietzsche and AI, John, in, I, I, in, in ten seconds. I thought that there'd be a lot we'd be discussing this evening, but Nietzsche I didn't have on my dance <laughs> um, No, no, no. I think, it, I think it's really important questions because I think that actually... Dorinda, what you said is right and sort of not because you've now got machine learning. Mm. You've now got machines that are able to learn themselves and decide which way they're going to take themselves. And I just kind of worry that, in putting this in a slightly political mm. context, is that throughout this kind of the whole internet age, 
regulation has just simply not been able to keep Absolutely. up mm. with the Bingo. technological changes that are leaping forward from Alphabet, from Google, from you know Meta and Facebook, and all the rest of it. Mm. And legislators, whether in Australia, whether in Britain, whether in America, are totally left behind Absolutely. by this. So, so Anne, just Absolutely. just quickly on that, and this is your your wheelhouse, of course, because yeah. it's early childhood Absolutely. education. And there, there are there are this really raises questions about ethics and the ethics of AI and the responsibility of those who are producing And also regulation. It raises and regulation, about what you're prepared to allow. Ethics, regulation, and think about the privacy of your information. Every time you ask the chatbot that question, more and more information is being put into the, the, the big data pool from which it pulls. So there are, there are real ethical and legal questions around this. And you're absolutely right, John. We are miles behind where we need to be, and technology is so mm. rapidly evolving that it's almost the, the, the horse has already bolted, yeah. right? Um, but on the use of, of AI for criminal activities and, act, and the bad use of AI, I've always said criminals are not innovators, they're opportunists. So whatever technology happens, whatever advances in technology happen, they're going to find ways to exploit that. We need to be building technology with safeguards in place. For example, the cheating thing. Why couldn't it have a watermark on it? That if you print out from an, uh, from, from, uh, an essay, hand it in, there's a watermark on it that the teacher knows that it's not yours, OK? Me, as a teacher, when I was teaching, when I was a professor, I could tell straight away if someone's work was... they cheated, because I insisted that they reference their work absolutely perfectly in Cambridge style. The AI can't do that. It can. It can <laughs> reference in Cambridge perfectly mm. With the right full stop and comma? Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> OK! OK! The Listen, idea. At this point, <laughs> at this point I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring you the results of our online poll. Now, we asked you, are you concerned about the increasing presence of artificial intelligence in our everyday lives? And... Uh, can I see? Someone, someone's got their head in front of the screen, and I can't... There we go. 57% yes, 31% no, and 12% unsure. Um, but, Toby, it's here. Um, that's the reality. And just to, to quote Nietzsche, Nietzsche did say, who are we to erase the horizon? If you erase the horizon, what are the consequences of this? This is here, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And I, I'm really pleased by that poll because it says that, that people are waking up to the idea that AI is going to be part of their lives. It's not just part of, you know, geeks like me. Who it are already being, is. Yeah. It's, it's already part that's of your right. lives. And that's something we should be worried about. It's, there's great opportunity. Those same tools can be perfect personal tutors to people. Mm. They can provide, um, you know, we, we had the Grattan report saying, you know, we need to provide um, a billion dollars worth of personal tutoring to, to, to help disadvantaged children. Well, here is a tool that can provide that mm. at much less cost, possibly. Um, uh, and that we get to choose the future that we want. And we obviously have to demand that of our and, politicians. And we, and we don't get to get them to write Valentine's Day. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's but, but, that's but the really lesson. Bad at Te technology is not destiny. Yeah. Society right. gets to cha cha change technology as much as technology changes society. And it's all about us making the right choices, mm. sitting in places like this, deciding mm. what is it the future we want to have. And I don't think that's actually in the future, Toby. I think that's yeah. here and now. It's here and now. Robo Debt already proved what yes. AI can do mm. for everyday Australians. And I think that we need to have that front of mm. mind. And it is the voluntary principles that... that People, you know, that yeah. use AI right now. You have now, to keep have remembering to it's not sentient. It's not human. Yes. It's based on algorithms. Yes, that's the question. But look, we could go on all night. <laughs> yes. um, I'm going to move on to another topic. Here's Luke Jenner. Thanks. Um, the BBC has a global reach like no other news outlet. However, it also has its problems, strict impartiality being one, which I assume, John, were instrumental in you seeking a new career direction. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly a year on from your departure, how do you think the BBC needs to change in the future if it's to maintain its integrity and influence? What a great question. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, part of the reason I left the BBC, you're right. I thought that they were getting the definition of impartiality wrong. And by which I mean, and I think that public broadcasters around the world are struggling with this, whether it's here in mm -hmm. Australia or in Britain as well. But, you know, when I was covering Donald Trump at the White House, and something that was... I won the 2020 election. No, you didn't. The votes didn't stack up, 
and there's no, sometimes there are issues where there is not on the one hand, on the other. Some people say two plus two is four. Others say two plus two is six. Only time will tell. John Fraser, <laughs> BBC News, Westminster. No! Two plus two is four! And we've got to be able to have the confidence to say that. And I think, sometimes think that public broadcasters, public service broadcasters, struggle with that a bit and just kind and of get themselves tied does... into knots. And I saw it, I thought, felt over the Brexit debate Well, I was, was going to get to that. What, 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 how did that play out, the idea of impartiality both sides in a, in a referendum like Brexit? So there was a false equivalence that took place whereby you'd say, well, some economists say it's going to be a catastrophe for the UK economy. Others say it's going to be great. Mm. Actually, nearly every <laughs> eminent economist said it was going to be bad and, you know, seven years after the vote on Brexit, it's not going that well. Um, whereas you had to struggle to find the people who would say Brexit is going to be a liberation for the, the UK economy. And so I th sometimes think that we give people a misleading impression in news by acting as this. That, I mean, what is the equivalence of some people say that Ukraine has been badly done by by the invasion of Russia, but others would say, no, there, you know, <laughs> it was wrong. It was a flagrant breach of international law that Russia went across the border of Ukraine. And I think sometimes we need to have the boldness to say things. I believe in impartiality, but I think it needs to be a bit more muscular and a bit more aggressive sometimes mm. because there is so much false information out there. Just, 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 just hold that thought, please. <laughs> Hold that thought for a moment, please, because I, I, I do want to go to Dorinda because um, you know, John raised the impact of media coverage and impartiality on Brexit. And I'm just wondering, we're in a, facing a referendum this year over The Voice. How are you seeing that play out in the media debate and the way it's being framed around questions of impartiality? Who gets to speak, on the other hand, on this hand? How do you think it's, it's impacting it so well, far? Well, I think it's very easy, uh, Stan, and I want to thank Tony for the, for the question. And um, I think it can be hijacked very, very easily. And I think that, um, you know, giving a plug for uh, the ABC, the independent, you know, it should be well resourced. It, 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 it basically <laughs> creates an important platform and particularly for our mobs in regional, mm. rural and remote areas, you know, having access to that information, being able to get that information that is impartial, that is independent, but also we need to make sure that it's well resourced and we see that particularly in uh, emergency uh, management and disasters like floods and bushfires. This is why it's so important. It is so critical. And in the voice context, it's absolutely critical because we need to hear all sides of that to be able to remain impartial. Keith. No, thank you for that. And congratulations to Dorinda on yeah, her Dorinda. elevation today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, we are having a referendum here, and I'll take the word muscular that you used about defending what's right. We've got to be very careful about that. And I'll give an example from the US election, and I agree, you know, there was, there was a result and it should be respected by those who didn't succeed. But the Hunter Biden story was put aside as fake news, but it was... Joe Biden's son. That's and right. And, and it, was, it was a legitimate story that should have been aired in the United States, but people decided they shouldn't hear it. We should never have that in a democracy. So in this coming referendum, I'm really pleased to see that the Albanese government is going to have a pamphlet go out to all households showing a yes and a no case. And, and no criticism of, of you, Stan, and the ABC, but I, I remember once there was We're a... We're big enough to take it, Keith. Yeah, I'm going to have to take <laughs> it. Go ahead. I'm going to take your shot. <laughs> I, I remember... Uh, you know, long-time viewer, but I remember watching an episode that you did on The Voice and there was no one speaking against it. And, and that's changed, but we should always trust Australians with hearing both sides of an argument, even on the ABC. And sometimes we ask and people don't turn up. But you did tonight, Keith, and thank I, I, I thank you for it. Um, <laughs> we can only speak to the people who will come on. Okay. Next, we'll hear from Tony Devereux. Thanks, Dan. My question is to uh, Dorinda Cox. Um, I'm on the wrong side of 70, so I've spent 50 years voting in state and federal elections and council elections and so on. And when I go into a polling booth, I, I'm seldom thinking about individual candidates. I'm always, mm. always thinking about a political party. And I think that's the way most Australians vote and most Australians think when they get to the polling booth. Um, which brings me to wonder, can we improve in the area of... Um, 
when a, a member of parliament um, defects from a political party, should we ask them to resign so we can have a, a by-election or perhaps the party they originally represented can choose a, um, a candidate from that party that the people voted for at the election? Yeah, thanks for your question. This is very relevant for the Greens now, of course, after Lydia Thorpe's defection. Absolutely. And Tony, thank you very much. And, and it's a, a live uh, issue, um, particularly for our party. And what I want to say is that democracy is, is the ability for all Australians to vote in every election. So whether it's local, state or federal, it's your vote that counts. And you are voting for the values of a party, but also as individuals. So we've seen a whole lot of teal independence uh, at the last election. So you are voting, uh, whether it be above the line or below the line, for the party or for the person. So uh, I don't have a particular view that is uh, wedded to, um, you know, whether a person should step down, whether they leave that party. Um, I believe that um, every Australian should be exercising their right to vote and uh, they are choosing, uh, you know, whether it be Anne's party or, or Keith's party or, or my own, um, in that, based on their values and the way that they operate. And, and for us, it's in the policy landscape and, and sticking to our values and we're about um, ensuring that we collaborate and, and work with grassroots democracy because that's one of the values of our party. And I think what we should see is that people can see themselves reflected uh, in our parliamentarians uh, within uh, whether it's the federal parliament or the state. And so th that's up to us to exercise that and we have the right to do that as casting our D vote. Dorinda, in this case, no one had any was left in any doubt about what Lydia's position has been throughout and what she campaigned on and that she has always spoken very strongly about um, First Nations sovereignty. So yeah. people were in no doubt about that. She has walked away because the party is not honouring, she says, what she believes. What does that mean for your party? Well, I think that um, Adam Bant has been very clear that um, Lydia was able to stay within the party, um, you know, to, to exercise her right to... Um, to campaign on um, black sovereignty. And I think that um, that's, a, that's been a very personal choice of Lydia's and I respect her decision in relation to that. Um, I, now coming into the First Nations portfolio, um, will pick up uh, the work now and, and lead into the future the important work that we're going to be doing on voice and referendum. And part of that is also the machinery of the referendum. So I will be looking at ways to increase our First Nations uh, voting, um, making sure that we are looking at um, ways that the referendum is being held and the pamphlet that Keith just talked about. I think they're all important issues that are part yeah. of the democracy. Uh, and I might bring you on this as well because there is a question, a, mm. a fundamental question that, um, that Tony's raising here, and that is keeping faith with what the people intended when they elected you. If someone leaves the party, should they stay in the parliament? Is it should be able to move to the crossbenches? I think it's different for lower house and Senate. Mm. I think more people vote on the lower house, like on the lower house when you go to vote um, in the lower house, you're voting for the person and you've got a choice of maybe seven candidates. Mm. Um, voting in the Senate, unless you vote below the line, you are voting for the party, mm. right? And that's how most people vote. Most people vote above the line and they vote for the party. So I do think that a discussion needs to be had. I mean, about, about you know, is this something that the Australian people feel so strongly about that it should be changed? that if you leave your party in the Senate that, and go to sit on the crossbenches or, or, or go hmm. um, to a different party, uh, that you're, you know, if, if, if Australians have voted for your party, they voted for your party, the party chooses who goes on the Senate ticket, right? Right? But on, in the lower house, you are choosing based on but individuals and it's reflected in the fact that, you know, for lower house uh, members, there is a lot more campaigning that we do. We do a lot more of the one-on-one, the, -on -one, the door-knocking, the personal, because it is about vote mm. for me. You put yourself as the candidate. Yes, you're representing a party, but you are the candidate. Ke Keith. <laughs> Do you on that? 
I, I think Anne made a good point about the difference between the Senate and the House, but, but we are all guided by the Commonwealth Constitution. And if you open that up, it doesn't mention political parties. No. Yet we all know, if you're in the audience or, or watching a prime this at minister. home... <laughs> that's right. So there's so much for our system that, that is implied into our Constitution. And, and that's important to remember when we go to this referendum later in the year. Um, it would be a cheap shot for Anne or I to have a go mm. at the circumstances no. of the Greens. We've all been there. Uh, but I will say this. Yeah. Uh, as we have. I've got a list here. I could... <laughs> Bob Catamark, Latham, Cheryl Kerr. <laughs> But I'll say this. Uh, uh, Lydia Thorpe is a senator for Victoria and all Victorians. And, and, and that's her democratic obligation and the people she serves when she's that's in the right. Senate. Hmm. We're going to finish tonight's discussion um, with a lovely question from Kabir Mehta. If you had a choice to invite four political leaders across the globe, past or present, to a dinner party, who would they be and why? President Vladimir Putin's presence is mandatory. Mm. So they have to be Putin, alive? No, 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 oh. no, they don't. And Putin ha is, is already oh, there. He has to be there. <laughs> He's already there. So you've got three after Putin, Toby? <laughs> Uh, well, I'd actually invite Putin and a few other people like Hitler and then blow up the dinner table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yes. Um, yeah. Nice question, Kabir. Mm. OK, so Putin's already there. Um, I'm going to invite Huda Shadawi, who was an Egyptian woman mm. who was an Arab feminist and caused the wave of the Arab feminism wave. I'm going to invite Malcolm X, because I think he's got an interesting story. Oh, and Dave. <laughs> Second chapter. <laughs> yeah, she owes <laughs> Dave big time. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, eh? Uh, I'd like to invite Dave as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we need to get Dave on the show, is what we think. But I, I would single out two, so. Uh, Three. Well, now you got Putin's no, already there. Well, so, so you're eating. To save your time. You're eating with Vladimir Putin. Oh, okay, so I've got Vladimir Putin. Uh, Robert Menzies. My seat is named after Robert Menzies, and I put this question to him when you were speaking to the nation in World War Two. What prompted you to speak about home ownership, and what would you say about that today? I'd also like to invite Dr. Carly Moore-Gilbert. I thought her courage mm. in a prison in Iran mm. was just phenomenal. And then she's come back here and has spoken so bravely about what's happening in Iran. And, and I think she's a phenomenal Australian, and I'd love to have her there. And then my staff said not to say this, but I'd love to have my mum uh, at a dinner. <laughs> She'd be very angry if I didn't have her there as well. With Dave. Dr. Rinder. I think I'd have to go with Michelle Obama. Like, if you know anything about black women, they're the strong figure behind the man, and uh, Michelle would have been pivotal in, in Barack Obama's, um, uh, you know, candidacy. I don't know how, and, yeah. how she get along with Vladimir Putin, but... Oh, um... I don't know about that, but um, I would also... Uh, I think about Grace Tame. You know, I know Grace, but inviting her to a dinner party would just set that alight. Um, she would be great, and I think my last one would have to be Malcolm X, which... Uh, I'd have mm. to share with him. We'd have to share him. We can put Putin in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plan for that one. Okay, now come out. <laughs> well, you've interviewed most of them that are alive today, John, so I don't know whether you want to go for the ones that you know Dorinda, or the ones... I, so, so I interviewed Obama and I then got invited to the Christmas party with Michelle and Barack wow. Obama. And we... My wife and I had our photos taken big, big with noting here. I know, yeah. I know, it's yeah. such a name. <laughs> so, so, so we drank champagne. We ate the finest food that the White House chefs had ever prepared. Mm. We floated back home to Georgetown in Washington, <laughs> D.C., to our house, where our dog had managed to get up onto the dining room table, ate all the mince pies, which are full of sultanas and oh, raisins, no. Oh, no. which are oh. deadly for dogs. We had to take the dog to the animal hospital, oh. which it turns out it's as expensive for dogs to be treated in the US as human beings. <laughs> $2,000 later, the evening lost some of its luster. Yeah. So, you know... Mm. Um, Having yeah, to do with Barack have... Obama's not always a good idea. <laughs> I'd have Volodymyr Zelensky. And Ooh. Putin. Ooh. Probably on opposite Ooh. sides of the table. One, one of those very and long then, tables. And then you could... Very, very long tables. Then you could, then you could you know, have the peace talks or the... Um, or yeah. what, but mm. you've got two other spots. OK. okay. Um, not I'd the Obamas. I'd have, loved to, I'd have loved to have met Nelson Mandela. Mm. Mm. Which I, 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 I did. And he did lived you? Up to and was every, he named? lived up to every expectation? Yeah, expectation. Named, yeah. he'd, be on, he'd be on my list. And? Yeah. And obviously Anne, because Dave's not going to go out with her tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs>
I was thinking, I was thinking a lot about this, and you know, I thought, I mean, if if Putin's, I, I would definitely have Nelson Mandela. I spent a lot of time in China, so I'd like to have Chairman Mao. There are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of questions, mm. and you know, I, I would, I would, for a lot of reasons, not all of them, Pontius Pilate, mm. prelate. Who I think you've rules? Too much. No, 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 no. I've, well, I have, but I don't know. Could you imagine the conversation? Could you imagine the conversation. I'm trying. Um, great, <laughs> great, um, great, great question. That's all we have time for. Thanks again to our, our panel. Um, Dave wasn't here. Uh, but <laughs> in spirit, he felt like he was. Yeah. Like he was. was. John Sobel, <laughs> Dorinda Cox, Keith Wallahan, and Ali and Toby Walsh. Please thank them. for sharing your stories and questions. Next week, we're live again from Melbourne. And joining me will be, this is a good one, join me next week, tennis champion and broadcaster Elena Dockage, communications minister Michelle Rowland, shadow communications minister David Coleman, and youth advocate Imogen C Senior. A lot of discussion next week about social media as well. So head to our website to register to be in the audience. You've been fantastic tonight. Thank you so much. We had a laugh as well. Have a good night. Thank you. Woo.